As the sky grew darker and the grasses and waters and asters became bolder in contrast, I became hopelessly transfixed upon the young man, whom I now saw as little more than an extension of the waters, his body a vessel up against a wave machine of fears generated inside him as a reaction to the book he was reading. And strange as this may sound, I found myself like a child in the summer, seeing the shore for the first time and running across the beach toward the tremendous foaming surf, declared for immersion. Without a second thought, I was no longer sitting on the stone table. Rather, the stone table was supporting my weight, and the scene was no longer pastoral or anything out of Jane Austen's body of work. No, it was now Van Gogh, or a Capote, or a Dolly, or Garcia Marquez, surreal. I could no longer fight the feeling and rose to my feet. I was light, I was strong. I walked through the hedges to the boy and placed one hand on his head. I looked up to the sun, a bold orange in a purple sky, and saw myself from above. And there we were beside the reflecting pool. And there were the asters, shining stars all around us. There we were, embedded in a moat of 100,000 roses like a wreath all around us. And the current of fear began its transduction into the sustaining lifeblood coursing into me, out of the boy and into me. My God, what a rush! The entire step seemed to be moving, circulating around us, the emerald pool at its center, turning like a solar system. The last thing I saw was the boy convulsing beneath me. His book fell to the ground, the pages of the philosophy flapping in the air, circulating warmth all around us. I blacked out, and when I awoke moments later, I was being accosted, pinned down by a gardener who had rushed to the aid of the young man, along with others who slowly became aware of something terrible happening down where the silver waters cascaded. They all jumped upon me and wrestled me to the ground, and I was strained by my neck in the grass burning my face, and my arms were twisted up behind me in too much pressure of a man twice my size all upon me and angry, yelling for someone to call the cops. I could not see the boy, for there were people all around him. I was worried for him. I really was. What terrible thing had I done? My heart was pounding and my head was clear, and I was glowing with a charge. I began to smile against the pain, but I couldn't move and the pressure only became stronger. I believe my organs were getting mashed. I was trying to speak, but I could no longer breathe. The man was twice, twice as strong with his anger behind him. And because I wasn't able to answer his questions, who are you? What have you done? He was becoming increasingly resentful and forcing me, pushing me into the earth, distressing the C4 in my spine, bullying me. What the hell just happened, I wondered my mind racing with asters commingling in the synapses and drawing away any negative thoughts as they were seeding. The only electrical communications carried across my CNS like a bullet train through my body gathered into a sea of euphoria and calm. Still, my body was helplessly pinned. I centered my heart and vision upon my friends, Freddy, my sister Bless, and opened up a line of non-local touch, which very quickly was telegraphed to them, and they both stopped what they were doing. Freddy dropped his tools beneath a car in West Oakland. Bless rolled off of Everett in bed. They pinpointed my GPS with their skills, cell phone free, and rushed to help me. Freddy skidded off the Grand Lake exit and blew a red light dangerously merging on the Grand Avenue and rolling down past the theater in its political marquee. See the forest for the trees. No more bushes. Freddy found me at a pair of jeans. Bless had made it to the front door, half-dressed with the keys to Rhett's pickup in her hand, when he grabbed her and pulled her back. They were both hot and perspiring. 
She demanded he let her go, but he was laughing in her ear and kissing her all over and running his arms around her waist while she squirmed to get free. Get the hell off me, Rhett. I gotta go. She could not cut loose from him, however, and he took her body right there, throwing her on the couch. She howled. I could hear her in my head, and I could feel him stabbing inside her, too. I howled at the grass, which backed down to the force of my breath. This was the last exhalation I would take before losing consciousness again.